I'm at Victoria Coram. You don't have to trust my words. Leave this to me. We will meet again soon. The Duke was definitely a mysterious character because as much as we encountered him throughout Resident Evil Village, he always gave off an aura of uncertainty, making you question if he's a friend or foe, what exactly was he, and why even help Ethan Winters on his journey to save his daughter Rose, which in this video, we'll uncover all the story details that surrounds this jolly old character, what initial concept designs and development that were made for him that never realized the finalized version of this game, and my overall theory of what he represents, what he actually is, and why even help Ethan in the first place. So without any further ado, let's delve into the mysterious lore of the Duke. Uh, I've been waiting for you, Mr. Winter. To preface, the Duke places a main merchant within Resident Evil Village. This is something that we haven't seen in the series for many years now, the last being from Resident Evil 4's merchant, which oddly enough, the Duke was acquainted with him. So besides being the main source of ammo caches, weapons, and other miscellaneous transaction functions, the Duke actually played a significant role story-wise within RE Village, because unlike the merchant from RE4, here the Duke actively helps Ethan on his journey in this godforsaken area, giving him much crucial information that would help him save his daughter Rose, providing sort of a layout of the region and some more details on the upcoming enemies that he'd have to face, which in essence, being a source of calm and safety in the middle of all the chaos that was going on, especially when we see him throughout the various areas of the village, because we know that once he's in sight, we can have a small amount of relief. I am but a humble merchant. Our first sighting of the Duke happens right after we escape the Four Lords meeting and the traps that came along after, with the initial introduction to this larger than life man was very interesting, because from the get go, he admits he knew of Ethan Winters and his precarious situation. This of course is only the start of the many theories of his mysterious past and his knowledge of the game's situation, though continuing our conversation with the Duke, he doesn't seem to set off any kinds of alarms in terms of being a potential foe, not at least at the present moment, but his presence alone will already begs many questions, because so far into the storyline in RE Village, we knew this whole area has been ravaged by many lichens and monsters alike, with countless lives lost in the process, but here we are in the Deuce case, just parked right outside Castle Domitresque, with a nonchalant and jolly demeanor, completely unattached to the ongoing chaos that was happening outside the castle walls, which to him is just business as usual. Now to business. Weapons, ammunition, healing salves, anything you desire, I can provide. And upon further inspection of the Duke's caravan, not much sticks out of the ordinary, as he says he has healing salves, ammunition, etc. And looking at the other side of his emporium, he has his trusted steed to help him move around within this village, which is actually an important point within this game, because later on he will act as a guide for Ethan in the middle of his journey. Though moving along, if we look inside of his carriage, we will find something of interest that we'll talk about later in the video. Though in the end, this small banter between Ethan and the Duke was perfectly summarized with this quote. That castle arouses suspicion. Yeah, and so do you. Seeing the Duke in many areas of the game would become commonplace, and my first thoughts of seeing him within Castle Domitresque had me wondering on how he even got there, let alone find a room specifically made for him, because here we can see a chair and a table already set up for his arrival within the premises, indicating his later designation after meeting a certain checkpoint. Though with that said, you'd think that Lady D would be aware of his presence within her castle grounds. Quiet now, child. Well, you know what? She does. Because just after walking inside the castle, we do find a guest book that confirms the Duke's business with Alcina, with a small passage reads as January 5th, the Redneck, delivery of one male, three females. January 28th, Mother Miranda, meeting with Mistress Demetresque. February 1st, the Duke, business discussions. <laughs> This important small information makes it concrete that the Duke is someone of importance within the area. Not only that, it confirms his active presence within the storyline of the game because previous titles did have a separate menu exclusively for buying and selling goods. But here the Duke is not just relegated to that role without any context to the story, but an actual character that even the enemies of this game were fully aware of. So in essence, he plays two important roles. That one, he was an actual
natural realized character within the context of the story of the game, but also presents a place on the in-game mechanics outside of the storyline. This of course was intentionally made this way by the developers when creating the Duke, but we'll talk more about that when we discuss his character creation and development later on. So now the presence of the Duke within the castle is only the start of his many sightings in this game, which here, helping us move forward as we try to kill Lady D. And once that's accomplished, we move on to his next location, which would be at the altar site. We meet again! Duke, why are you here? Finding the Duke here by the altar side would be one of the most important cutscenes in this game, and I love how he's the one to reveal to Ethan that he was holding his daughter Rose within that yellow flask, not only that, telling him that she can still be saved, and hinting at her unique powers, though how he knew of this information is left to be said for our theories later on. But for the time being, this revelation only helps guide Ethan for the rest of his objectives within this game, though not taken lightly for this distraught father, which I can empathize with. He'll pay you for find out this is a lie. The next step was to make our way to the house with the red chimney. Here, the most important information that the Duke wanted us to know was found in one of the diaries within the house, which it reads, February 9th, I was instructed to take items to the cave church at sunrise, but what I saw was frightful. The great four lords were there, and Mother Miranda was holding a child. She whispered something and touched the child. I can't explain it well, but the child turned into white crystal? Then, then she... I couldn't help but speak up, and I asked her why she did such a thing. Mother Miranda just smiled at me. This is the chosen child. She will return to her original form no matter what befalls her. Then she gave each lord a part of the crystal in a flask, and they left. I forgot to bow to Mother Miranda before I fled. I'm still shaking. What did she do? What is that child? Who, who could even do this? She can be saved, you know. Saved? From this? Are you insane? So upon returning back to the Duke, our main objective of the game would be laid out for us, which was to gather all four flasks containing different parts of Rose, and assembling all the pieces of the Wing Key, this in the order of defeating the remaining three lords of the village, which the Duke gives a brief summary on. I found these feathers. Now tell me how to fix this like you said you would. Settle down. First you must use that key and collect all of your little Rose's flasks. Where are the rest of them? There are four in total. You have the one, and the other lords have the rest. Lords? Mother Miranda is the cold, calculating ruler of this village. Four lords serve under her. The first you've already met, the Lady Demitresque. The second lives deep in a valley of mist, the doll maker, Donna Beneviento. None of her playmates have ever come back from that dank old estate. The third is Moreau, a being of twisted flesh that lives in the reservoir past the windmills. It is said that he is not the only monster that lives in those waters. The fourth and most dangerous is Heisenberg. He works in his factory on the village outskirts. And the project. Let's just say parts of the human imagination are better left alone. And as the conversation between the Duke and Ethan ends, the important question that surfaces here was this. But in typical Duke fashion, he replies in a cryptic business talk. Why are you doing all this? Why, it's all part of our first-class customer service. Please do come again soon. So as stated before by the Duke, in order for us to save our daughter Rose, we have to defeat the remaining three lords of the village, which our first step was to go into the Valley of the Mist and defeat the seemingly supernatural Donna Beneviento and her doll Angie, which on the quick note, this was the only area between the four lords that the Duke wasn't actively present in, because moving on to the next lord, which would be the grotesque Salvatore Moreau at his reservoir, defeating him and gaining the next flask and wing key part, which here, unlike the Beneviento estate, we find the Duke near the 
the control panel that opens up the water gate, and lastly making our way to Heisenberg's factory. Here the Duke would be found inside the elevator as we traverse through this area, eventually eliminating Carl Heisenberg and destroying his army of soldat monsters. No! No! Where my army? That soldier punching asshole! But after that, our next sighting of the Duke happens after Ethan's revelation that he was a mold being, explaining that he was murdered by Jack Baker three years ago during Resident Evil 7. And the only reason Ethan was still alive was because of this fact, giving some clarity as to why he's able to endure so many injuries. But now, moving back to present time, we find ourselves inside the Duke's carriage. This happens after a massive battle against Carl Heisenberg's mechanical form, which the Duke does acknowledge, and is even astonished that Mother Miranda revealed herself. But what I loved the most about the small cutscene between Ethan and the Duke was the momentary relief that was provided, where we can fully trust the Duke, knowing this jolly old man was there for Ethan. Not only that, he provides more information in regards to Ethan's current state, noting that his body was at his limits, and that this essentially would be the end. Are you sure of this? Your body is, well, falling apart. Even at this point in Ethan's journey, the mysteries behind the Duke still continues, raising the question on where he was during the Heisenberg fight, how he knew Ethan would survive after Mother Miranda seemingly killed him, and still why he acts so benevolent. Take me to Miranda. I assumed as much and am already on the way. We should arrive shortly. Thank you. Speaking of foolish questions, who or what are you? <laughs> Even I can't quite answer that. I owe you one. Mr. Winters, I'm afraid you can't return to your old world any longer. Are you ready? Yeah, I have to be. So in order for us to have a calculated answer on who the Duke was, we have to go back and cover the initial concept of this character, and what design and development changes he had prior to the game's release. Which we can start with this image here, and as you can see, it looks like a more grotesque and gluttonous take of the Duke. This initial concept art has a major plot change for the Duke that never made it to the finalized version of the game, which it states here. Early development concept art for the Duke, the merchant. From the very beginning to the final game, he was always going to be a large character. The Duke is a merchant and a foodie, and was going to be the fifth lord in early drafts. In RE7, we utilized a photo scanning technique for character designs, but in RE8, we decided to be more creative and tried a character design that didn't look like regular humans. So just finding out that the Duke was originally supposed to be another lord of the village was an amazing revelation, and with this concept art, I can definitely see how this could have come about. Just imagining a twisted version version of the Duke, and having to fight him would have been a great thing to see, because if that were the case, we can assume that he gained some type of power from the Kado Parasite, similar to the other four lords of the village, but in what form would that manifest? we'd never know. I am but a humble merchant. Though going back on topic of the Duke's character development and changes they've made, which with this next image here, the art director explains the original encounter with the Duke, stating, designed for the merchant, the Duke. He was originally going to make his entrance with a runaway carriage and his horse running wild, but this was axed during development. This compared to what we saw from his initial encounter outside Castle de Matresque. And lastly, let's cover the Duke's overall character design and the portrayal by Aaron Laplan, the voice actor for the Duke, which in an interview he conducted explains several processes that went on to create his take on the character, starting with this small summarization of the Duke's change from a set location to the constant change of said locations in Ari Village, stating, quote, I've played games before that have merchants, and I imagined that he would be in some centralized location, and that he would sell you some stuff, and I'll probably just say the same things over and over again, like, well, that's a good choice. The reason why they took so long is because they took the Duke a step further. They said, yeah, he is going to be situated in this one area, outside of the village. But when you got all the stressful and scary parts of the game, when you are fighting the four lords, he will show up there too. So I think they were still trying to work that out." End quote. The next summarization that Aaron Laplante gave was his process of creating the Duke's voice, where he states, quote, I also saw a picture of the character I was playing, and he was really big. So I did 
did my accent for that. I sort of knew what my voice was gonna sound like, but when I got in there to record the very first line, I've been waiting for you, Mr. Winters. Anyone who is anyone has heard of the likes of you. They progressed my voice from an Eastern European accent into something more light and lilting, almost as if he has a British accent without having a British accent. So as we went on in the game, and as I settled into the voice a little bit more, that's when this thing came out, the voice of the Duke. Anyone who is anyone has heard of the likes of you. So moving along the interview, another question was brought up, asking Ern how he would describe him, the Duke, to a gamer, which he responds, quote, I think I would say if they're a gamer, they got the relationship with him that you do with most merchants in most games. However, I do think that they took the Duke a little bit of a step further. They made him extra helpful to you. At the same time, they also made his personality kind of mysterious. So you rely on the Duke a lot, but you don't know if you can trust him. Those are some of the greatest characters in history, these anti-heroes. Ones that you always expect right until the last moment to turn on you. Especially in the Resident Evil universe, it's supposed to be scary. You're supposed to feel alone, kind of bleak, in a sense. I would say that the Duke provides the player with a level of relief that they've never had in a Resident Evil game. That's why people love the Duke so much. Please do come again soon. And so continuing forward with the interview, the next question that was brought up was if Aaron knew anything about how Capcom put the Duke's look all together and what their influence was with that. Which Aaron replies, quote, As far as the Duke goes, I will say that when I first saw a picture of him, he still had the suit and the enormous belly that hung over. Swelled feet, his face was a little bit more grotesque. He was bald and I only saw a brief picture, but it looked like he had some growths on his face. However, I think that they very intelligently decided to make him more cherub-like because that ended up being the function that he's just this kind, nice, helpful friend along the way that you don't know if he's gonna turn on you. This is just me speculating, but at one point they might have had a plan for him to turn on Ethan and then maybe they were like, no, it's more important for him to be a friend to Ethan. You don't have to trust my word. And lastly, within this interview, Aaron was asked in regards to the Duke's background and the other mysteries that surrounds this character. He replied back, quote, Whether it be people making mods or writing their own fan fiction or putting out videos that discuss theories about the Duke and where he came from, what he's all about, anytime anyone asks me where I think the Duke came from, I just reference all of those videos because there's no way I could be as creative as them. It's incredible. There are little clues, like that moment when Ethan is in the back of his carriage and he looks down and you see that sigil, you think, was well, the Duke a lord and then he turned good? And sometimes I wonder if he's psychic somehow. Does he have a psychic ability? Because he knows where to be, wherever Ethan needs him. Anytime he talks to Ethan, he gives him advice, as much as he seems mysterious. I also try to add in that he knows Ethan is going to succeed and that he's being kind of playful. That's what I thought when I was doing it, as if he was kind of psychic. It'll pay you if I find out this is a lie. <laughs> Uh, Fuck Joker. And so before we end this section of the video, another interesting take on the Duke's voice was mentioned by Aaron. And once I listened to his explanation on how he changed certain tones and mannerisms to the Duke's voice, it made a lot of sense as to why he seemed to be so mysterious. Because Aaron explained that while portraying the Duke's voice in a very jolly and upbeat fashion, there were still some small underlying sinister tones that came out here and there which was intentional, and this change of tone from an upbeat nature to a more of an underlying sinister and baritone mood produced a voice that we can have some sort of relief, but still had to have our guard up, again adding another layer of the mystery to this character. Oh, I'd wager there are few who don't know your name here, good sir. <laughs> you won't come across this information just anywhere. A lovely weapon, sir! A little bird whispered this to me. Ah, <sighs> because of all this commotion, I've lost an entire territory to transact in. Take care. Well, we know so far that the Duke was a person of prominence within the village, someone who was known by the other characters in the game, so the notion that he's just a real-time game mechanic that's completely separated from the story's context is out of the picture, because besides that guest book inside Castle de Matresque, referring to the Duke's business, another note can be found in one of the side areas within the village, which in this diary, it mentions the Duke, stating, 
July 8th. Today's the day the Jolly Merchant stops by. He always gives me old newspapers. I know Miranda forbids them, but the news of the outside world is always so fascinating. There was one thing that piqued my interest in the last one. It was an article about some medicine company. I don't remember the name, but their emblem looked familiar. This emblem he's referring to was the Umbrella Corporation logo that was directly inspired by this wall here. Of course, this stems from Oswald E. Spencer's visit many decades prior. God. Though going back to the Duke, to find out that he seems to be a regular person who travels between the village and the outside world was interesting, again establishing him within the context of the world of the village. But as mentioned throughout the video and the many questions that were brought up, who exactly was he? And why was he so helpful to Ethan? Well, if we kept things simple, we can just literally just see him as a regular merchant, and his sole objective was just to make as much money as possible, and if it meant killing the four lords in order to get their special treasure, then that would have been the most plausible answer. And funny enough, he does have some special lines when you do sell these items from each of the lords. Oh, Lady Dimitrescu. Beautiful even in death. That waistline, yes. Ah, Miss Angie. Just adorable. This is Lord Moreau's? I suppose it's what they call the beauty of the grotesque. Oh, the assemblage of life and machine. I can feel Lord Heisenberg's essence through it. Though another theory arises stemming from this exact notion of selling the essences of the Four Lords, which was the theory of the Duke collecting these items to grow stronger, because we can only assume that the Duke is somehow connected to the Megamyce in some way, because we know that it acts in a hive mind or neural pathway of sorts, allowing those under its influence to gain information when in contact by it. So this would conclude that the Duke is somehow a mold being himself, and the act of him buying these essences or treasures and making contact only furthers his power. Also, this explains why he was so willing to help Ethan in his pursuit to save his daughter, because it meant killing the four lords at the behest of the duke. <laughs> also, the fact that he is a mold being, that could explain how he knew of all the other information about Rose's unique powers, Ethan's crumbling body, and how he was able to move from place to place within this village area. A clear example of this was with Mother Miranda, and how she was able to move freely within her proximity. Fuck you, you crazy bitch! Also, another indicator that could hint to what the Duke truly was, was the sigil found within his carriage, which upon further inspection, it shows an owl with a horse next to it, and the symbolism of an owl is usually a representation of wisdom, a clear reference to how the Duke knew so much about the ongoing situation of Rose's unique powers, the four lords and Mother Miranda, and the other many plot lines during this game. I am but a humble merchant. And if we inspect further, there was a quote just underneath the owl, which it reads, Le Jean Defend Le Droit, which translates to, Money Defends the Right, which the only connection we can make out of this is with the role the Duke had as a merchant or as a businessman. So dealing with money is something he does on a regular basis, but to defend the right, that's still a mystery that's yet to be answered. And if anything, this sigil of the owl could be a family house symbol, similar to the other four lords of the village, which makes sense, since the Duke originally was supposed to be the fifth lord, or he may still actually be one without anyone knowing. You don't have to trust my word. And lastly, the final theory that has been speculated was that the Duke was still a mold being, but was there to assist Ethan on the behest from his daughter Rose. This reasoning stems from again the Megamyce acting as a hive mind neural network, but the influencing factor was from Rose directly, which could explain why the Duke was so helpful to Ethan, and how he knew that her essence was still intact even when crystallized and separated between the four flasks. Your daughter's essence is still intact. And before we end this video, the last connection we can make with the Duke was with the merchant from Resident Evil 4, because he does have a special dialogue that mentions this. What are you buying? <laughs> Just something an old friend of mine used to say. Anyways, who do you guys think the Duke truly was? And what are your theories about him? Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Also, if you guys enjoyed the content, then please feel free to like and subscribe for more videos like this in the future. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, you guys have a great rest of your day. And this is Hey Deva, and I'll see you guys on the next video. This will be my last time watching you walk away. Till next we meet.